Emily Mills, um, we're actually interviewing you today at the BMAT STEM Academy. Um, what was the motivation for taking this place over? So we were approached by the Department for Education about two years ago who were concerned about the old Sir Charles UTC which was finding it hard to recruit children, reputation wasn't great, the outcomes for the children wasn't great and so they were looking for a sponsor. We haven't considered it at all actually, we didn't, like a lot of people, we didn't really know very much about the UTC but we met with the sponsors of this organisation which are Raytheon, Princess Alexandra, Glaxo, um, Anglia Ruskin, and we realised that they were trying to do something quite innovative here. They were trying to ensure that very bright and passionate STEM students, so kids who like science and engineering, would get great qualifications but also would get opportunities to get into the workplace and really understand what those what the career opportunities were like in that in that um, sphere. So we thought, oh, that might be quite good for the young people of Harlow. So we, we've spent the last two years negotiating with the Department for Education about the viability of this school, um, and on the 1st of September it became Burton Mill Academy STEM. Um, with, it's currently got 50 children, and they're all following a STEM career, and they're all working with the sponsors very closely so that they get industrial experience. So these are very still, these are now very early days for you? Yeah. It's had a great start. We were working in a soft partnership last year to get ready for the reopening this year because it's been rebranded, reopened. Um, in 2017, we didn't actually take any new children because we were unsure about whether the school would actually stay open. But yeah, so it's early days, but we're really pleased with the start actually. The feedback from the children is great. The sponsors are really engaged. They're in lots of different experiences that you might not necessarily get in a in a traditional comprehensive school. And, and as we're talking about the, the developments, um, I think it might be about three years ago, it was probably the last time I interviewed you, and then you were almost on a fact-finding mission regarding Sir Frederick Gibbard College. Mm. You're now way, way ahead now. So how are things, I ask you, how are things going with the development there? Yeah, great. It's a little bit different. So Sir Frederick was meant to open in 2018. Um, and the reason we were opening St Frederick is because Essex approached us about a shortage of school places and at that time they thought they were going to be short of about 180 school places in 2018 but population has changed slightly so now we're going to open in 2019. It's going to be um, a school for 120 initially although by 2021 the intake will have grown to about 240 and that's because there are just so many people moving to Harlow so it's a great place to be um, and it's going to open um, on, in temporary accommodation on Burt Mill's site it'll be a very small school to start with and then September 2020 it's going to open um, in a brand new build and do you I think one of the some people wondered whether you'll be actually to fill English and maths you know when it comes to sixth form development you know yeah. yes but subjects like History, etc. Yeah. You, you do so, it, you'll be able to fulfill Yeah, so the Sir Frederick follows the Burt Mill model. It's got a very sort of traditional curriculum in Key Stage 3, and then it's got our very innovative curriculum that we do in Key Stage 4, where children do GCSEs early. But then it will have a sixth form. The sixth form will open in 2020, and that will be a very academic sixth form. And the reason the Department for Education in Essex and Burt Mill decided that there was a need for that is because we do find a lot of our very academic children leave Harlow and go and study in Hertfordshire. Some do go to Harlow College, some do go to St Mark's, but the majority we were finding were getting on the bus. So we wanted to stop that brain drain really out to Hertfordshire. Because again, I think probably the first time we met about five years ago, there were, there were people saying you have to put Hertfordshire on your new catch form because it looks better than Essex. And it's all, yeah, it's all, all part of that, isn't it? But how are you going to get them, I guess, how are you going to get them off the bus, you know, and say, listen, yeah. I'm here to, to tend to road? So first of all, so the first lot of applications for Sir Frederick are in. So we've already had 160 applications for 120 places. So in year seven, there's already going to be a waiting list for next September. Um, and then for the sixth form, we've already started talking now. We know within the West Essex area, and that, so it's not just for Harlow, you know, children in Epping, Ongar will be able to access this provision. We already know there's the demand there. 
because the, the issue for children who have to travel to Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire schools are great. They offer great provision, but the, the travel and the cost of travel is a barrier for some children, actually. So for some children, it's taken them an hour to get there. So people, when we were thinking about opening the sixth form, we did a lot of research. We um, surveyed parents and students, and we know it'll be oversubscribed. Can we take it back for a second to your first week nine years ago? Yeah. What was your first week nine years ago like? <laughs> Yeah, so nine years ago I took over as the head of Burt Mill um, and I hardly knew much about Harlow really, um, but I fell in love with it straight away and I, I promised the governors of Burt Mill that I would stay here for a really long period of time. I said at least 10 years because the school had had quite a, a checkered history and heads had come and gone. In fact, I think it had had five heads in five years, so it needed a bit of stability really. So, yeah, when I first came, my intention was to stay, be head of Burt Mill for a good 10 years, get it to be a great school, um, and enjoy doing that, but then things have changed. But you now have how many schools in your sphere of influence? So we've got 10 schools, um, and when Sir Frederick opens, that will be 11. And the schools range from Stansted to East London. So we, we base our demographic is from Stansted to City Airport. Right. And did you have that in mind? I mean, nine years ago, I just want to bring it through your first week and then take it from there, maybe. But did you have it in mind at all? Or has this been a sort of organic process? So, first of all, there weren't really very many academies when I first started. And um, I don't know if you were around when academisation started in Harlow, but I was the most vocal against academisation. In fact, Burnt Mill was the last school to academise. Um, and we only academised because all the other schools had had decided to, to make that choice and so we were worried about being isolated. So it was never part of the plan, it was never part of the plan to become an academy but then there was a change in government and the governing body at Burma at the time decided that if everyone else is doing we, we need to do this for our children. Um, and then because we've been so successful we just keep getting approached by the Department for Education. We've got 10 schools with an 11th opening, we could have actually had 50 schools by now. We could be in Basildon, Peterborough, um, Walthamstow, but actually we've made we've made a decision that we want to be small um, and we want to have a group of secondaries and a group of primaries because what we've found is that when a group of schools work really closely together and really collaborate and aren't competitive with each other, that actually improves things for everybody. So you get people ringing up saying, can we join your gang? We do, or we get the department saying we need someone to help, and it's usually very vulnerable schools. So every single school, apart from Magna Carta, we have sponsored. So that means that you know it's a school that hasn't been performing as well as maybe it could. So what's your now as the executive executive head? Yeah. What's your role day to day? Well, I still teach at Burnt Mill. It's right. my baby. <laughs> so I still teach there five hours a week. I teach English GCSE. Um, but then most of my role is, so first of all I'm the accounting officer so I have to make sure that the finances of the trust are secure and probably the most important thing I do is that I work with the heads to make sure that the outcomes are improving for the children and that the kids are getting a really good deal. You're a tough boss. <laughs> uh, I've got very high expectations. Um, you know, we have a sort of unofficial motto about work hard, play hard. So we do expect people to, to give a lot of time, but then also there's a lot of payback um, for that. Because the school time does get criticism, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. I think one of the things, you know, I mean, we were missing all these things like special needs and things like that. Yeah. You, you know, and probably when I put this story, there might be people making comments, etc. Yeah. Do you accept that sometimes people criticism people make, but do you think it's unfair? Uh, I think it's hard to get everything right all the time, and I think we would be, I would be wrong to say that everything's perfect in every school. But I do think we listen, and if we do get something wrong, then we make sure that we're developing stuff so that we can get it right. Um, on the I, think, side, I, think, I think it is unfair about the, the special needs. I think, um, you know, some people like to perpetuate a myth because, you know, why does a school get such great results? So some people like to say, oh, it's because they don't include special educational needs, but actually we are inclusive. It's the law anyway. Um, and people might say there's ways of not accepting children with special educational needs, but it's, it's not true. Um, 
most of our schools have got higher than national average numbers of children with special educational needs and in fact we've deliberately, you probably don't know much about the London School or Stansted but both of those schools have got special educational needs units and again we, we went and approached those schools to join us because we wanted to bring in their expertise and we're actually um, we're opening special provision in one of our primary schools um, in the next 12 months as well. So some of the criticism, sometimes we don't get things right, I agree, but some of the criticism I think is, is unfounded really. And if you looked at the facts, BMAT is a, is a group of schools that is committed to making sure that children with special educational needs do well. When do you see the whole, the whole BMAT being say five years time? 11 schools no more <laughs> so our um, so we've been very clear about what we want so um, we were clear that we wanted to support the schools in Stansted we we sponsored Forest Hall because nobody else would take Forest Hall and it was a very vulnerable school financially at the time and we also wanted a school in London because there's a lot of commuting between London and Harlow um, and we wanted it as a, a way of really developing our staff. There is a difference training to teach in the city and teaching in Harlow. So we, we went and approached that school partly to support us with our teacher training as we're a teaching school. So one of our big jobs is to try and recruit new people into the profession. So currently we've got about 46 people training to teach across the organisation. So those were deliberate choices, but that's the that's the end of our growth for a while. What we've decided is that we've got our five secondaries, we've got our five primaries, we've got BMAT STEM, we need to make sure we're collaborating to make sure they're all really strong schools. Because some of them, are, they're on a journey of improvement. We published a hundred stories in a year um, over, over last year, and there's, there's an incredible amount of celebration of what your schools do, isn't there? From whether it's Spinney or, or Burton Mill, etc. There's a real feeling of success, achievement, and a lot of, a lot of people, really, even last week at Little Parliament, there's a little memory garden in the city. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of achievement and success for them, wasn't it? A lot of people seem to be very happy doing what they do. So, well, I suppose that's what your point about criticism is. I think we're, we're probably like Marmite, is you either love us or hate us. And I think, you know, a lot of the parents and the children really love the experiences that they get. Um, and some of the criticism we get is why, why are we always having children <laughs> in your Harlow or in the Harlow Star? But actually that's part of our strategy really is that we think young children should be celebrated and anything that they do should be made public really. You know, that's the one thing I'd say. When I first came here nine years ago, I think Harlow was given a very bad press. Um, and actually I think the town itself had quite low self-esteem, but actually I think Harlow's, it's on, the, it's on the up, it's not, people are moving to Harlow because it's a great place to be, so part of our celebrating the children is that people realise that these kids are great. I, I walked in here this morning, I met one of our ex-students, he's at Harlow College, training to be a carpenter, I saw a burnt mill child, child coming here, he's getting all grade nines and he's doing engineering, I just thought, you know, we, we produce great people in Harlow. <laughs>